Uh, in the beginning, somebody say, in the beginning. In the beginning. Say it louder. Say, in the beginning. In the beginning. Uh, Pastor Paul created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Jenny created the heavens and the earth. Pa uh, uh, Miguel created the heavens and the earth. No, in the beginning, come on, help me. Who did it? God. Come on, say it louder. Who did it? God. God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that's what, that's what happened. We don't believe in a big bang. We believe that a big God, come on, created everything that we see. He says, the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. I'm so grateful that no matter how dark it is, how void it is, come on, the Holy Spirit is still moving. Yeah, then God said, somebody say, then God said. What did God say? Come on, help me, everybody. Then God said what? Let there be light. And there was. And God saw that the light was. Say it in Spanish. Bueno. Bueno to your bueno. And God saw that the light was bueno. Then he separated, watch me, the light from the darkness. God separated. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called what? Now watch. Don't miss it. Verse 5. And evening passed and morning came marking the first day. Leave that there. What we do is we say morning comes, darkness comes, that's the day. God doesn't do that way. God says darkness may come first, but light is always going to come at the end. I want to prophesy right now. Can I prophesy right now? Somebody may be in darkness, but I got good news for you. Light is coming your way. Oh, I would clap if you really believe that light is coming. Come on, expectation of good is coming. Wow, I could just preach that, but that's not my text today. Genesis chapter 3, now we're going to go. God creates everything in six days, right? He says, he says to Adam and Eve, okay, eat of everything, but except one tree you don't eat of because God always keeps something for himself. It's kind of like, do you trust me, right? And so we know the story that, that they didn't listen to God and they actually fell, right? They, they have fallen now. And here's verse 8. And when the cool evening breezes, that word breezes comes from the Hebrew word, which is rock, which means the spirit. When the spirit of God was moving, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking. Uh, and, and this is some of you going to catch what I'm about to say. When God begins to move, you hear things. When God begins to move in this atmosphere, you hear something in your spirit. A, a God thought would hit you. You hear something, not with your ears necessarily. Come on, but with your spirit. That's why I hear that God is healing people right now. As we just declared that. It says, when the cool breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the gar garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. Stop. How many know that you can't hide from God? I'm just saying. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? How many know that God knew where they were? God doesn't need, come on, GPS. He's not asking them because he doesn't know where they are. He's asking them because they don't know where they are. See, some of you need to be honest and understand where you are right now. Some of you may say, man, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm a little bit far away from God. That's all good. Because, listen, there's no condemnation or guilt or shame. You just got to know where you are. That's all God's saying. Where, where are you? Where are you? Can you imagine Adam and Eve? Shh, God don't know where we are. Don't move. Don't rustle the leaves. Stop. Eve, stop. Because men always blame their wives for everything. Get married is true. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. It's in the Bible. Verse 11. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I command you not to eat? Now, God is not asking the question because God don't know. How many know that God knew the instant they ate of the tree? It's going to get powerful in just a minute. The man replied, God asked him, did you eat of the tree? What, look at the man. It was the woman. It gets even worse. That you gave me. Now let me help you out. 
If you want to blame somebody, blame your wife, but don't blame God for your issue. Can you, I mean, this guy is gutsy. He's like, the woman, I was good by myself. Life was good. I'm playing video games all day. You gave me the woman. <laughs> like, now, now listen, look at how merciful God is. Because if I was God, I would like, guess what? I'm going to give her a new man. Poof, you're gone. <laughs> See, the verse would have read, and there was smoke in the garden. <laughs> and a new man named Brad Pitt came out from everywhere out. <laughs> That's an old school one. I know you guys, it's like Ephraim, whatever his name is. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman. The, in the narrative of the scripture, the first time God ever speaks to the woman. And he asked her a question. What have you done? Well, she said, if my husband could do it, I could do it. The serpent, he deceived me. That's why I ate it. So he goes down. God goes to the next one. Then the Lord said, he didn't ask the serpent the question. In fact, he starts cursing the serpent. Look at how God deals. God deals with his sons and daughters differently than he deals with the enemy. He asks to invoke a conversation. He don't ask the devil anything. He takes dominion over him. Oh, don't help me, Jesus. Somebody... I was out to eat the other, uh, last night with some people from at In-N-Out Burger. I treated some, I treated a couple people, and I could always treat at In-N-Out because all four of us ate for twenty-five dollars or twelve cents, and that was double doubles with fries, drink waters. If you come to eat with me, you're getting water, not bottled, with the cup. Now, if you want to cheat and get Coke, I'll I'll just turn my back back on you for a second. And somebody said, when, when they, 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 they went and did it right, they went and talked with their pastor, they felt like they were being called here, they got left with a blessing, all that kind of stuff was really good. And, and th that, that guy said, he said, well, do you know that church is really Pentecostal that you're going to, this church LV? They go, they, like, they talk back to the guy, and they shout, and they get excited, and it must not be this church, Okay. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, what? Because you have done this. You have done this. You are cursed. Right? More than all the animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility. Now, here's the scene. Here's the narrative. There's Adam. There's Eve. And there's a snake with no legs to stand on. Come on, somebody. That's an old preacher joke. So this is the narrative, right? It's not, it's not like they're off in a corner. It's, it's that they're, they're, they're together. And so what God is doing, he says this. He says, now I'm going to cause, watch, hostility between you and the woman. Between your offspring, devil, and her offspring. Then he says a line that is just strange. And he will strike your head. Well, he's not talking about Adam there. So he, in, in 15, it's the, it's the very first prophecy of Christmas. He will strike your head. A blow to the head will kill somebody. And you will strike his heel. You'll bruise him. I want to talk to you very briefly in the time that I have. And the title of the message is, In the Beginning. Somebody say, In the Beginning. In the beginning. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I have a question for you. How many of you are planners? You are a planner. You, by nature, are a planner. Wave your hand in the air. In fact, some of you got thrown because you didn't plan on responding today. <laughs> it just messed you up because that's not how you are. Okay, so let me see all the planners. I'm putting my glasses on because I'm turning 54. Amen. I'm getting stronger and better looking. Amen. How many of you are planners? Come on, wave your hand in the air. Ooh, look at you planners. Okay, how many of you are go-with-the-flow kind of people? Let me just see your hand. Now, what's so crazy is I see some people that I know that are married, and one raised their hand for one thing, and one raised their hand for the other thing, which means marital counseling is coming real soon. 
So I tend to be a planner. I plan everything. I plan vacation. I plan when you rest on vacation and when you work on vacation. So a typical day is like, okay, guys, tomorrow's coming. Okay, Bella, BJ, Benaya, Wendy, okay, here we're going to do. Okay, we're going to have breakfast at 8.30. Okay, then we're going to clean up. And then at 10 o'clock, we're going to hit the pool. And then we're going to lay out from about 10 to about 12. Then we're going to have some lunch. After lunch, we're going to play a little bit more. And about 3.30, we're going to be finished. We're going to go back to the room. And we're going to all shower. And, and, and then we're going to eat some dinner. And then we're going to get a red box. And we're going to, and, and, my, and everybody's looking at me. <laughs> like it's vacation. I said, no, we got to plan it. <laughs> well, there's only one that really likes it is BJ. Come on, he's a planner like me. Because my wife, she thinks breakfast is at noontime. Come on, somebody, help me. Why are you shouting like that? <laughs> so, so can you imagine if you are a go-with-the-flow kind of person, life is good. Now, let me tell you something, planners. Planners, I'm a planner. Let me help you. Planners, we keep the world going round. But go with the flow, people. Keep it fun. Don't get nothing done, but it's fun. Have no strategy, but it's fun. Are we having fun? <laughs> and so what happens as a planner, because I'm a planner, if you're a real planner, you have a plan A. But you already know you're married to a go with the flow. You not only have a plan B, but in my case, I got a C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z. Her name is Pastor Wendy. And so because what happens as a planner, you're a planner, I'm a planner, go with the flow people, just check out for a moment. But what happens is, is that if my plan A doesn't work, then I got to go to plan B, and it's kind of a letdown because it's like, well, that's not really the way I really wanted to go, and we're not really getting, you know, and if it goes, dear God, it goes to plan C, and, and this happened 20 years of vacation. I've gone to a plan D or E or even F, and I'm like, why are we even on vacation? <laughs> we just need to drive back. <laughs> Wife says, you have such a bad attitude. Now we went to plan Z, <laughs> which is I'm leaving. You stay on vacation and see how it goes with you. See, as you guys all starve because your mom doesn't have a plan. <laughs> I'm just saying, you want to eat, you want me around. Because what happens is, isn't it true that, that we think it's less than? Because the ultimate didn't work out. Can I tell you, that's not the way God operates. God isn't like, oh, plan A didn't work, going to plan B, going to plan Z, going to plan C, D, E, F. Ah, didn't know Adam and Eve would blow it. Because if we're not careful, we begin to put our thoughts into God's thoughts. Like God begins to operate like we operate. Like some of you are still, are still you know, uh, upset because what you thought should have been the ultimate plan didn't work out. But how do you know that that was the ultimate plan? Could it be that God is still able? Watch me now. Though he doesn't cause everything, it says he can cause everything to work together for your good. That he can redeem everything. Come on, can he restore everything? That he could begin to tell you, come on, 2019 could actually be your best year. That you don't have to say, oh. Maybe it didn't work out because that wasn't the best. Maybe you were selling for plan C when God had plan A. Ha-ha, <laughs> I feel good at 10 o'clock. Whatever you gave me, Pastor Paul, it works. I don't know if it's legal or not, but listen. I know that's all you're going to remember. What was he, what, what, what did he take? He seems happier today. <laughs> I went to a dispensary. From heaven. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, in the beginning. See, when we begin to look at Christmas, I begin to re realize something that we always think that Christmas starts with the Virgin Mary or with shepherds or with angels or, or you know, the three wise men. Or, and we always go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John if you've been in church long enough. But then I begin to pray, and, and, and I really begin to realize that, that 
is really not the beginning of the Christmas story. It's the fulfillment of the Christmas story. That if we are actually going to understand the narrative of Scripture, the narrative of Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, is the story of Jesus. Everything in, in Scripture is about Jesus. It's either like, like prophetically talking about the coming Messiah or when Jesus actually is born of a virgin and we celebrate that day called Christmas. But that is not the day it actually was planned. We have to go all the way back, come on, to in the beginning. Because God, watch me now, always had a plan. Come on, somebody, in the beginning. In fact, some of you are sitting here right now. It's not because your friend invited you, your mama invited you. It's not because somebody else invited you. Because God, in the very beginning of time, you would be sitting here right now in the seat that you're in right now, hearing the message right now with the preacher wearing some funky pants right now. You... Nothing is by chance. We don't believe in the universe. We don't believe in karma. We don't believe. We believe a God is ordering our steps. We believe our God is for us and not against us. We believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. So we got to go back. And if we go back, we read in Genesis chapter 1. And it says that God, in the very beginning, created the heavens and the earth. And if God said this. He says, he says, as I created the heavens and the earth, then it says this. It says that the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the earth. But it said this, that the Spirit of God was hovering, was above the chaos and confusion. Why is this encouraging? Because all of us will have a day one in our lives. All of us will have sometimes in our lives where it seems like there's confusion, there's chaos, there's void. And if we're not careful, we keep looking at that rather than the Holy Spirit that is hovering above everything. That we have a God that is still above everything. And by the way, if you're in him and he's in you, that means you're above everything. That means you're seated with him. Come on, in heavenly places. you got to quit looking up at your problem and begin to realize you're up above it and start looking down on that problem. So there was darkness, there was void, but the Spirit of God began to hover upon that chaos and confusion. It was lacking purpose. There was no, there was no, 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 nothing that seeming was working out. But yet in the midst of that, all of that, the Holy Spirit was working. I got good news for you that the same Spirit in Genesis 1-2 is the same Holy Spirit that works in your life. Not only was the Holy Spirit operating and moving, because sometimes we think that, when we see voids and darkness that the Holy Spirit isn't moving, but in, in, in verse 2, it says that he's hovering. That, that word hovering, it, it literally has an, an, an image of, a, of like a hen that is, that is literally hovering over her eggs and, and incubating her eggs because something is about to change and shift. And, and so God wasn't just kind of like looking at everything. He was setting everything up. And it says that on that in that area, in that time, it said, then God said, let there be light. And he saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. The first thing that God did, watch, was his words. See, words are not primarily for communication. Words are primarily for creation. Your words create atmospheres. Your words create environments. Are you hearing me? That, that, that somebody's words can lift you. Some of these words, come on, can pull you down. I, I just was standing back there, and, and, and a couple of people said, man, Pastor, you look really good today. I like your outfit. A gentleman was walking in. He goes, man, you dress really good. I like your style. Man, I'm feeling good. I'm like, I'm feeling it. And then somebody else said, why are you wearing those pants? <laughs> the words change the environment. I said words change atmospheres. Here's what we do, though. We want the atmosphere to change, then our words change. Could it be if you change your words, the atmosphere will change? Huh? Somebody in the back, I'm just telling you because this is what happens. And, 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 and this was actually a good day because sometimes people tell me stuff and I go home and I'm depressed. Some lady said, I've seen pictures of you from about 10 years ago, and I actually think you're more handsome today than you were 10 years ago. I said, thank you, but I'm married. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Somebody say words. You got to be careful with words you speak, not only to others, but the words you speak about yourself. You need to wake up in the morning and start declaring what God says about you in the mirror. 
Oh, I know you're not perfect. He, he understands that. You need to say, you know what? No, I thank you, God. I'm a son or I'm a daughter of the Most High God. Thank you I've been blood-bought. Thank you that I've been redeemed. Thank you I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. Thank you no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Thank you, Lord God, that all my needs are met according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you that my steps are being ordered by the Lord and you delight in my way. Thank you, Lord God. I believe you have a destiny and a purpose. And my name doesn't have to have the last name of Osteen to make it happen. See, we think that Joel Osteen has some kind of special kind of like, 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 like direct line to God. No, he has the same line you got. It's called the line of the word of God. And you need to begin to, to declare what God says about you. Because we know that psychologists and psychiatrists and would tell us that we have what they would term self-talk. We all have self-talk. Like some of you are like, man, I'm feeling good today. Ooh, I got a good outfit on today. Some of you are single. Ooh, I'm going to find him or her today. Praise the Lord. Ooh, I saw the way they looked at me. Ooh, yeah. Mm-hmm. We always have self-talk happening. You know how you change your self-talk isn't just by becoming positive. It's by changing the information you take in. That's why the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I believe that everything I put my hands to shall prosper. I believe even when I make a mistake, God is able to redeem that mistake. See, so, 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 so God said, and there was. God, God said, and it was. So what happens now is that all this stuff is done. And now what happens is, is that mankind is, is made now out of the earth. And there's Adam. And then out of Adam, out of the side, comes this lady named Eve. And he calls her, whoa, man. Because when he saw her, he went, whoa, man. <laughs> oh, preacher joke. Right? And what a, what a great setup, man. I mean, how good is God? There is no competition. It's like she only has one. Here I am, baby. Are you hearing me? That's so good. I mean, God is so good. It's like, and she looked at him and says, is that all I got? I guess I'll take him. You know what I'm saying? And so, so what happens is, is that they have all the garden to eat of, and God says, there's one tree you don't eat of that tree because I always have something that's mine. I want you to trust me. That's why we believe giving to God financially first is all part of this whole thing. That God says, will you trust me first? Come on with the first part. And so what happens is that we know the story. Adam and Eve, they ate. Eve ate, and she gave to her husband, and you know the whole story. And what happens is that now mankind, watch, mankind, man moves from light to darkness. They were living in the light. They rebel. They have a fall. And now they go into darkness. They thought by doing it their way, their eyes would be open. But when they did it their way, their eyes were open to the wrong thing. So shame came in. Come on. Condemnation came in. Guilt came in, which was something that you and I, we were never meant, watch me now, to experience those emotions. And so it came in, and instead of their eyes being open, their eyes were actually darkened. So they actually became blind to what they really had. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, talks about the God of this world, which is Satan, blinds the minds of those who don't believe. We cannot get people to see because the enemy has blinded their eyes, and that's why we need the Holy Spirit to come in and illuminate people's minds to actually see the truth that is before them. So now they go from light, somebody say light, to darkness, say darkness. So the question to be asked is, how is God going to respond to this? How is God going to respond to the fallenness of man that now they have the perfect garden, they're living in light, they're living in abundance, and they choose to go their own way. They eat of the tree. What is God's response to that? And, and this is so powerful because when you look at God's response, it's amazing because it is a glimpse of Christmas to come because God doesn't move away from the fall. Watch me. God moves into the fall. God still came with the full knowledge of what Adam and Eve 
had, had done. He, he still comes. He, he, he's actually seen them eat of the tree. He's actually seen them partake of the tree. He sees the whole interaction. And now he sees when their eyes are open. And what do they do? Watch. They try and sew fig leaves together. They try and cover themselves. They try and find significance. And, 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 and unless we, we say, well, that's weird. Why are they doing that? We do the same thing. Except we sow success together. We sow possessions together. We sow, we sow likes on Instagram together come on we so all trying to find our identity but you can never find your identity in creation only in the creator let me say it to you this way let me say it to you this way you can never find fulfillment in pleasure pleasure was given not to bring fulfillment but to let you enjoy what God has created but you have to do it in, in the way that God has, right? Fulfillment is when I recognize I am his and he is mine. And that now my identity rests in something that's unchangeable. It's not how much I earn or don't earn, how famous I am, who I hang out with, who, it, it, none of that. Watch, there's nothing wrong with pleasure. I enjoy golf. I enjoy going to movies. I enjoy a good meal. I enjoy pleasure, but pleasure should not bring fulfillment. Fulfillment is in Jesus, and out of that, I can enjoy all that he has for me. Are you hearing me? So what does God do? Watch. God, with all the knowledge that God has, this is so powerful, because with all the knowledge that God has, right, God moves into the fall. It says that God, watch, he came again. He didn't break the pattern. He came again. In the, in the cool evening breezes, he's coming again like he did the day before and the day before. And yet Adam and Eve are now hiding. And God is coming. And God is coming towards them. God is moving towards the fall of man. Now watch. We think that God is judgmental and that God is angry and God is mad. If that was the case, Genesis is the book of beginnings. I could preach probably a whole year on the first three chapters because there's so much in there. But in the very beginning, God shows his character. God shows that sin will not keep me away. And he comes and he moves in the midst of the garden. And he begins to say, Adam, where are you? It's not because he doesn't know where Adam is. He understands that Adam doesn't know where he is. Now, he doesn't understand his position. He doesn't really understand what has really happened. Where are you? Can you imagine Adam and Eve? Shh, Adam, shh, Eve, shh, shh. Quit scratching your back. You're moving the leaves. God doesn't know we're here. God's getting closer. We're here. We're hiding. Why are you hiding? We're naked. How many know God knew they were naked? So God asked him, who told you you were naked? All God is trying to do, he's trying to get them to have a conversation with him. In my study, there's a great book you want to pick up and read. It's called Gleanings in Genesis by, by Pink. The author's last name is Pink. And in this great commentary, that is so thick, it's so full of stuff and revelation. He says, this is the very beginning of the grace of God. That the Father is coming after his children. That Adam and Eve are the image bearers. And that we have to get it right, Pink says, and I agree with Pink, that God always pursues us. We don't pursue God. That's why he's the shepherd and we're the sheep. Sheep don't pursue a shepherd. A shepherd always pursues the sheep. This is the Christmas story, my friends. This is the Christmas story because God still moves into the fall. That God still has a plan, and it's not a plan B. It's not a plan C. It's a plan A, and he comes and he moves into that place, and he finds them. He starts conversing with them, and now God gives a prophetic plan, and he begins to talk about Christmas in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, as he begins to say, okay, I get it. 
And the enemy that was in that snake thought that he had now gotten God in a, in a conundrum. He thought he messed up God's plan. But God didn't even give him that. God didn't even hint to that. God said, oh, no, 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 no. I already have a plan in the very beginning. I already have a plan. And it's plan A. It's not plan B. Because I knew they would mess up. I knew they would blow it. I knew it. And I'm still moving into their mess. I'm still moving into their bad decision. I'm still moving in to their dysfunction. Come on, help me. I'm still moving in to their bitterness and, and, and being offended. I'm moving in because I'm a God that moves into the fall, not runs away from the fall. I love this because in this is there's a prophetic picture of the coming Christ child. As he, in the very beginning in Genesis 3.15, God says, I want to make a declaration to all humanity. I want to make a declaration to all the darkness. I want to make a declaration to all those that have failed. I want to make a declaration to all those that think their life is ruined and messed up. I want to make a declaration to the young and to the old, to the married, to the single, to to the black, to the white, to the brown. I want to make a declaration to humanity that there is coming one. And when he comes, he's going to crush the head of the enemy. And when he comes, he's going to redeem mankind again. Somebody give God a five-second praise break right now. Shout that you make the person next to you uncomfortable. I guess that pastor was right. We are Pentecostal, whatever that means. If he labels us Pentecostal or, or, or people label us Pentecostal, then I have to label the Vegas Knights game Pentecostal. Because they run the aisles. Have you seen that guy? Have you seen him shouting? So what's the Vegas Knights game like? Pentecostal. You don't see anybody quiet. God says... He's going to bruise you, but he can't kill you. There is spiritual warfare. It may bruise you, but it can't kill you. Because the plan in the beginning was the one that is coming. It is not David and Abraham and Elijah, no matter how great Gideon was. It's, it was never any of them because he said, her seed, her seed. Women have eggs. They don't have seed. Seed comes from the male side. He's even prophesying that it's going to be miraculous birth. So Isaiah is not the first one that talks about, and she shall a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. You've got to go back to the beginning. If God was that intricate about creation, he's that intricate about your life. We're telepathic. <laughs> I felt like the Lord wanted me to start Christmas way back in a garden. Can I tell you how powerful this is? I'm landing the plane. There was a man in the garden. that heard God the Father speak to him, Adam. He heard what God the Father said, but didn't listen to God the Father in the garden. He reached out and took, partook of a tree that led us down a fall. But in Genesis 3.15, he prophesied God about the coming he, which is the Christ child, watch this, that will be born to crush the head of the serpent to fulfill the prophecy. This is what Christmas is about. It's about, watch me, God coming back into the chaos and confusion. 
not sending someone but sending himself and that birth would take place and this Christ child Jesus the Messiah would live 33 years and the scene would replay itself it would come full circle because there now is a man in a garden called Gethsemane and he's talking to God the Father and he says if it's possible this cup pass from me it's a flashback in a garden same interaction with God the Father nevertheless not what I want but what you want and the first man in the garden partook of a tree and caused the fall the second man in the garden obeyed the will of God and didn't partake of the tree, but got on it. Because he knew what Isaiah said. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Isn't it like God that a tree caused the fall, but a tree caused redemption? gets even better because God's word is true because it said you're going to bruise him that's why it says he was bruised for our iniquities he was wounded for our transgressions they pierced his side they pierced his hands and his feet and they put thorns in his head but they never ever crushed his head why were the thorns put on his head the curse came on Jesus so it could be lifted off you. Can, can you see that in Genesis 3.15 it was plan A. And when all hell thought they were winning come on Chronicles of Narnia. little mice that were eating away at the ropes and on the third day the tomb was open the son of God was raised in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 Pastor Paul was fulfilled that the birth death and resurrection of Jesus crushed the serpent's head and that's why we celebrate Christmas because in the beginning come on how do you want to believe that if God did it in the garden God could do it in your life how many want to believe come on that there's no plan B or C with God but God's plan will prevail in your life you should give God a hand clap by faith that he's working it all out When I moved to Vegas 17 years ago, Kmart was open. God said, they're just leasing the building until you're ready to possess it. I wonder what other buildings are being leased that we're going to possess. I wonder what God has for you. He's making the enemy pay the rent until you're able to possess it oh god help god help me oh he looks like he's possessing he's not he's a squatter god has him there and he's occupying what's going to be yours